rusty fly swatter. Nothing gets me hotter than a tossed smart water. Torn socks, torn box, unused tampon. You lose your grip and surely slip while wearing just one crampon. I'll get hot on this quarterly if I'm caught by some orderly and away to the nut hatch he lugs me. Up there in my cell, I'll mutter and yell, hey, litter bugs, litter still bugs me. What a gum, what a bum, such a scum to drop it. Blow me a big bubble button, I will gladly pop it. Dog collar, fruit baller, dried up sharpie, John, my gall, I hoot and holler like a snarky carpy harpy. As I sit in my gloom, in a square padded room, upholstered with vintage shag rug see. Through it all in my fall, I will scrawl on the wall. Cripes, litter bugs, litter still bugs me. Tic tac, kit cat, broken chair and underwear. Sure, there's more to find, but I just don't wish to look under there. Razor blade, window shade, battle gear and shoe tin. Drives me slightly crazier than Vladimir Putin. <laughs> it will stay in my head till the day that I'm dead. Until my family unplugs me Through the oxygen mask as I cough and I gasp I'll say, litter bugs, litter still bugs me Windshield wiper, dirty diaper, pink packing peanuts Send a sniper or a viper, they are driving me nuts Sanitary napkin, hypodermic needle Makes me want to curl up in the old position fetal Till this sick iniquity results in a liquid me And from a jug the cruel world chugs and glugs me I'll pick the same bone while I moan and I groan Whoa, litter bugs, litter still bugs me Nine volt, six volt, DC, double A and triple I'll squat a lot at every spot and soon I'll be a cripple Tropicana, Trump again, a burger bone and floss stick Curse the heavens above, even though I'm an agnostic. I try not to cry, I wish they would die. Yet until this mortal coil shrugs me, I'll ever rightly say each night and each day that litter bugs, litter still bugs me. God, it still bugs me.
is speedily spurred this flippant zippy, quippy, drippy ditty. Well, most folks believe that brevity is the soul of wit. Tell a joke with a brief bit of levity and make that the whole of it. Keep each verse fairly terse, each retort very short. Don't let a gag drag on my dear, I fear you'll lose the troll of it. Did you ever succumb to the tantalizing promises of an infomercial? The only one I ever gave in to was for tag away, guaranteed to get rid of skin tags. If you notice, as I changed shirts, it was not at all successful. <laughs> but I've come up with a product that nobody will be able to refuse. Let me tell you all about it. Remember when your fancy fanny, that desirable rump, was to quote the colloquialism as smooth as a baby's bottom? You could bounce a quarter off. But nowadays, it's where you fish for loose change at the vending machine. Are there so many creases you have to guess which is actually the crack? Is there a Sharpe in your undies? <laughs> have the ears been unkind to your behind? Is your derriere very square? Do you have a loose caboose? A mushy tushy? OK, now I'm just being cheeky. You get the point. <laughs> well, worry no more. It's time to rebooty that, the donk donk Straighten out your wrinkly old ass with Buttocks! <laughs> Why not put a shot of botulism in your bum? After all, it's already a bad piece of pork, am I right? <laughs> Buttocks comes in handy disposable hypodermic doses. Or if you're averse to a prick in the rear, there's also a convenient suppository option. <laughs> so don't wait a second longer. Operators are sitting by. Call 1-888-B-U-T-T-T-O-X. Buttocks. It's just the kick of the pants you've been waiting for. Caution, buttocks may cause extreme swelling of the posterior as well as tighten your back door so much as to create a lack of expression. <laughs> the next song was written in early 1994. Terminology may have changed in the new millennium, but the message remains the same. Be accepting of people who are different from you, and if they are not hurting you, there's no reason for you to disparage them. Embrace the differences while observing the bond we all share as members of one human family. <laughs>
language classes when they were distracted or rambunctious. My French has not stuck with me so well, so I translated this whimsical Parisian tune. Since I was barely sentient, I've always had a penchant for those who pay attention to what I've got to say. It's my one true intention to ease the world by tension. It is my birth contention that I'm here to pave the way. Never fear, we'll save the day. So listen up, you silly pop art. Make a note, you Billy Goat, and if I forgot to mention, pay attention. Your brain will gain retention, your fame will break convention, your soul will attain ascension if you'll only do the deed. They say lack of attention is the mother of invention, but if you pay attention, you'll invent with greater speed when your pent-up angst is freed. So think of that, you kitty cat. Yow, hear the word, you bitty bird. Tweet, are you sitting in detention? Pay attention. Your life will be more trenchant, your wife will drop pretension. No strife, no apprehension, true avoidance of all wrath. Your back will stop its wrenching, your tuchus will cease its clenching. Your legs will feel extension if you walk the righteous path, is the only choice thou have. So here is how you dare to now move. Pay some heed, you never say nay if you want to add dimension. Pay attention. A friend of mine treated me to the recent Mr. Rogers film. We laughed and cried and rejoiced in the wonder that he was. I often thought of going into youth programming. Here's a stab I took at it. I'm not quite sure why PBS and the Children's Television Network didn't pick it up. Hi, kids, welcome back to this week's edition of Why Does It Look Like That? The show that explains why things look the way they do. With me today is Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Andy. Hi, everybody. Jenny, what's your question today? Well, say, Andy, why does a basketball look like that? I mean, it's orange, and it's got all those lines on it. And why is it so big you can't even pick it up with one hand? Well, Jenny, if you look at a basketball and you think about Halloween, you'll notice that a basketball looks an awful lot like a bag of candy. No, Jenny, not a bag of candy. A basketball looks very much like a pumpkin, don't you think? Oh, my God, you're right, Andy. A basketball does look like a pumpkin. Now, why is that? Well, that's because the people who originated the game of basketball were an order of Tibetan monks who would climb into the tall Tibetan pumpkin trees to gather pumpkins, their main source of nutrition. It's true. A monk would climb each tree and shake the limbs of that tree, while other dozens of other monks ran around on the ground trying to catch the pumpkins in baskets. They always caught almost every pumpkin, and the monk who let one smash on the ground was flagellated by the others back at the monk house. Really, Andy? Really, Jenny. Well, let me finish, all right? One day, during a bad storm, one of the pumpkin trees was struck by lightning. Instead of burning to the ground, it retained the electrical charge and lit up the night with its glow. Soon, the pumpkins on the glowing tree grew very large. While before they had only been the size of bowling balls, they became much larger. When a monk shook the limbs of that tree, the pumpkins fell hard and ripped right through the baskets, exploding on the ground and sending pumpkin guts all over their fancy robes. All the monks expected flagellation. Some of them looked forward to it. But the head monk, who just sat eating pumpkin seeds and drinking pumpkin wine while the others did all the work, declared it a sign from on high. And the reenactment of dropping heavy pumpkins into weaker wicker became a weekly ritual. <laughs> it's true. And, uh, but in 1623, when the head monk died, a new head monk, who would never like the old head monk, devalued this ritual by turning it into a game. Instead of running around trying to catch a falling pumpkin in a basket sure to break, the basket was placed stationary about eight feet off the ground, and it was made bottomless so they could start recycling. <laughs> the monks would throw the pumpkin to each other or pass it, and then one monk would try to 
get it into the basket. And if he did get it into the basket, it was caught by an adolescent monk nicknamed a punky donkey monkey before it was returned to play. This game, because pumpkins were still the primary dietary staple, this game eventually led competing Jesuit priests to coin the phrase, don't play with your poop. <laughs> but what about dribbling? And, and, uh, and why don't they use pumpkins anymore? I'm getting to that, Jenny. Children should be seen and not heard. So, in the early 1900s, when unions were getting stronger, the punky donkey monkeys demanded more money. Well, money at all, actually, as they'd been paid, paid nothing prior. The monks, having taken a vow of, si of poverty, could not afford to pay them and refused. The punky donkey monkeys left, changed their name to ball boys, and went into the tennis round. Without the punky donkey monkeys, basketballs were being shattered left and right, while well, pumpkins, rather, wasn't called basketball yet. Pumpkins were being shattered left and right, which caused the great pumpkin famine of 1923. And the, uh, the, the monks, after much thought, developed a rubber air-filled pumpkin, which they neglected to patent. The Goodyear Company stole the idea, removed the rubber stem, thereby allowing the ball to now be dribbled, and founded the NBA. In the early 1940s, the monks took Goodyear and the NBA to court for infringement of intellectual property, but as they had taken vows of silence, they could not make a strong case for their <laughs> and they lost. And that, my good friend, is why you may see silently angry Tibetan monks in the nosebleed section at a Lakers game. <laughs> wow, Andy, is all that really true? Really, Jenny, every word. <laughs> Tune in next week, kids, when I tell Tommy why a Georgia O'Keeffe painting looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. As a child, I was not a fan of cats, as those I met scratched me and hissed at me, even though I was a gentle child, only wishing to give them love. When I was nearly 29, a friend on whom I was crushing asked me to take care of two Burlington cats until a place where they could live in Manhattan could be found. That friend never came back for the cats, and one of them died suddenly five weeks after I took them in. But the other lived with me for many years and made me a cat lover. This is the second song I wrote about him. He's got some jowls near his bowels. They wiggle when he howls. They jiggle when he prowls round town. But when the day has beat me, he's always there to greet me, to turn my every frown right upside down. Oh, he's absolutely divine. That cat of mine is fine. He will wind me out and pout till I finally let him out. Then from home he'll roam about our little hood. Jan will crap, but never scrap. And if I should make a laugh, gets upon it in a snap, just like a good boy should. Want to pet him, get in line. That cat of mine is fine. Every claw stipples and cripples my knees. And he's got nipples, though they're hidden under ripples of hair. He is bald below his ears from all that rubbing all these years when he's not tearing apart my favorite chair. Years we've known each other, nine. That cat of mine is fine. He's got eyes that get all gloopy, but his poop is never soupy, even though he gets that wet food every day. No curmudgeon nor racist wouldn't judge upon that basis. Doesn't even give a hoot that I am gay. What more can I say? In 99, God gave me a sign that cat of mine is fine. <laughs>
that was my intrauterine name for her, went to the dock for a periodic checkup. The obstreperous obstetrician clumsily broke her water, whoops, and my due date was moved up to a must-do date. <laughs> Thus, six weeks early, I was, from my mother's womb, untimely raped. A bouncing, bony baby boy. 19 inches, 5 pounds, and 14 ounces. Imagine my stats if I come at full term. Well, I was too weak, so for two weeks had to be incubated. Though Concord is New Hampshire's capital city, it is still fairly small, and in 1970, its hospital shared an incubator with a neighboring chicken farm. <laughs> As I was jaundiced with a little fuzz on my head, I was placed in with the unhatched chicks. <laughs> to help me blend in, they placed next to me an open legs pantyhose egg. <laughs> this one. At first, I was afraid to make a peek, but soon rose to the top of the pecking order. <laughs> While I flew the coop of that poultry existence to the free range of my parents' home, I never forgot my ornithological origins. <laughs> Months later, my first words were quack and quack. <laughs> and my first full sentence, cock and doodle doo. <laughs> I can still talk to hens and roosters today. <laughs> yes, I ate many of my Wigan family, but at age 25, overwhelmed with gustatory guilt, I became a vegetarian <laughs> to honor my fallen brethren who has shown such plump. <laughs> These days, now that I'm cocked with a walk, if someone calls me yellow or chicken, I say, I say, fuck you. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're offended by my foul sense of humor. <laughs> it was not my intent to ruffle feathers. I do a lot of thinking while driving back and forth between Burlington and Adamant, and Burlington and Concord, where the family is. It's where a lot of my songs are born, and whatever old car of my own or borrowed vehicle of a friend or family, I'm driving. Years ago, I pulled over and scribbled down lyrics on whatever paper was within reach. Since I've had cell phones, I now make voice memos and eventually transcribe the lyrics and finish the songs. And of course, beg my amazing arrangers to write yet more accompaniments for me. You know how that makes me feel? <laughs> My life's great, my life's full, and I'm grateful. Seems I'm fated to be sated with a whole plate full. God has slated things to be weighted in my favor, so I'll savor every flavor. I'll never waver, neither be hateful. When I rise, open my eyes, I'm always thankful. I won't pass life as a gas, it's a whole tank full. As I travel down this road of life, I will hit no speed bumps and won't jackknife for me, cause it's like a deposit, it's a big bank full. Some can't cope at the end of their rope, but I never waffle. To lose hope, I'd be a dope to do something awful. I'm too thoughtful to act unlawful or any such blather. I'd much rather take a hot lather and eat a falafel. You're down wearing a frown, take my advice. Draw a gown and head on downtown until you feel nice. Stick your chin out, keep that grin out, and it's more than sure that you'll win out. Over the worst you see any adversity, I'll say it twice. Make yourself pretty, then hit the city. Try to be witty, sing this here ditty. That nitty gritty that seems so shitty, your will will suffice. <laughs> Xenophobia rears its ugly head everywhere we turn. It gets incrementally better over the years, then seems to backslide. I wrote this piece in frustration at society's inability to understand, to accept, to tolerate what has no effect on their lives whatsoever. You're wrong. It's not a choice. If it were, do you honestly think I would choose a socially unacceptable option? Would I choose to be ostracized, hated, attacked, when I could just as easily be Accepted, well-liked, safe. Come on, use your head. Did you choose to be straight? And if so, could you change your mind at any moment and go the other way? I don't think so. If I made any choice, it was to deal with this inescapable truth about myself. You think it's a choice because you know I've gone the other way in the past. Well, I tried to make myself choose that way, but I was lying. To me, to you, to the world. People's lives are full of choices. 
But this is not one. I was amazed during the recent Quarry Works production of Peter Pan to discover in Chit Chat that one of our performers, Mary Beth Lefever, was one of my second grade classmates in Springfield, Vermont, just over 40 years ago. Our mini reunion led to a Facebook flurry of formative years friendship rebirth. And now we have an East School reunion planned for the end of October. When folks ask how we made this amazing long overdue connection, I merely say, it's elementary. <laughs> Kindergarten with Mrs. Davenon as our teacher, who now tells us for the reunion we can call her Kathy. Mrs. Davenon would twitch her fingers and turn into the Wicked Witch. One day she wouldn't let us uh, get it, go to the bathroom after story time started, and I ended up peeing in my snowsuit outside waiting for the bus. Lori and Colleen and uh, Paul and uh, Timmy, who had a bigger head than I did, if that's possible. Randy Gosselin, before that movie A Christmas Story came out where the kid sticks his tongue to the jungle gym in the cold, he did that, and I remember seeing a bit of his tongue left on it. My friend Jeff, there I am, looking at a bug, or very outside, uh, Kiki Norris, brought me a Santa Claus coloring book. And uh, at the hospital when I was having my tonsils out because it was Christmas time and it was her thing to give me a present. Amy Streeter and I were at the bus stop together and we were great friends, but we were throwing snowballs and she said, that was an ice ball. And she ran home to her aunt and I got on the bus when it came and I was about to take off and the aunt knocked on the bus, where's Gary Ames? And I just slunk down in my seat in the back of the bus and the kid next to me said, there he is. Thanks a lot, kid. And Jason Young was my best friend at the time. He's the smiliest kid in class. And uh, that's another Jason. I think I knew seven Jasons then. A uh, very popular name in the 70s. That's Johanna Hunter. This was 1975 and 76. East School in Springfield, Vermont, which is now being turned into somebody's private residence. And we will not be able to visit it, but we're still going to sneak onto the front lawn and get a picture. <laughs> and first grade, Mrs. Allison and her assistant, Mrs. LaBombard, who it looks like maybe goosing me, otherwise I don't know what that expression <laughs> means. Uh, Mrs. Allison cast us in. Peter Rabbit, the first show I ever did. I was Peter Rabbit, Jason, my best friend, was Mr. McGregor, and Courtney McGilvery was my mother, but in real life, she was my girlfriend. <laughs> and we were held in hands during arithmetic class, and don't you love that dress? I would love that. But anyway, <laughs> Mrs. Allison was like, uh, you know, stop holding hands, Gary and Courtney. So we waited until recess, and all the other kids said, Gary and Courtney, kiss, 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 and then we kissed for their entertainment. <laughs> and uh, many, many times. And uh, there's Randy Gosselin, part of his tongue had grown back at that point. Jason is still very smiley. Tyler Dana brought one of those pens to elementary school where they had the lady in a bikini on it and you turn it upside down and it disappeared. And uh, Susan Forcier, there's Georgie Porgy who kissed the girls and made them cry. I just kissed the girls and made everybody watch. And uh, there's Timmy still, the big head kid, bigger than my head. And uh, Mrs. LeBombard lived on our street. What else can I say? Oh, after the Pledge of Allegiance, Mrs. Allison played on her orange upright piano, My Country Tis of Thee, and we all sang along. And uh, first grade was really something special. When I got my coat caught in Farmer McGregor's net, Mr. McGregor's net, the third graders laughed, and that's when I knew that acting was for me. So pretty soon we'll go to second grade with Mrs. Polito. These are on a timer, so you know, Eric doesn't have to do anything up there right now. He can just take a nap. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Colito, come on, Mrs. Colito. I really have more. Oh, there we are, second grade. Mrs. Colito retired after she had me. I don't know if it had to do with me or not. Um, where am I now? I'm in the front row, and Amy and I have made up after the uh, uh, the ice ball incident of kindergarten. These are the Bayam twins, Laura and Joel, and they were like the toe-headed uh, Campbell Soup kids. <laughs> Good. Dana Blinkhorn. Before we were ever in school, I kissed her and uh, told my mom that I she was gonna have a baby because she got a tummy ache after I kissed her. So I <laughs> moved in with her parents. Um, Mary Mary Beth Lefever was the woman who I met here at Forty Works, and she I kissed her in the basement for a cookie, and uh, it was an ice cookie. Does that make me a prostitute? Uh, and Jennifer was my girlfriend at the time, so I kissed her an awful lot too. In fact, she was the girl I kissed most in my life until I met Elizabeth Wilcox here at Ford uh, a decade ago. And, uh, oh, that was Re Rianne, and uh, her name is Rianne. We went by Riri long before Rihanna, the singer, was even born. That's Doug Wachowski. Apparently, his great aunt was uh, Julia Child. Well, probably still is. I'll just that. And uh, that's Paul. We're going to see some of these people at the reunion. And. Um, Mary Murchie uh, had the bus stop later on in fourth and fifth grade. It was at her house. And uh, her, her, at one point, her house was painted black and white and it looked kind of like a skunk. But uh, she's aware of that. I'm not telling stories behind her back. And uh, yeah, so second grade. Oh, and after recess, we used to 
to hide in the class in very unsafe places, like in the oven, and in the, and Mrs. Toledo would come in and say, where's my class? And we'd all jump out and surprise her. Now, I don't really know if she really thought we were lost, or we believed her. This is Mr. Spindler. He was a third grade teacher and the principal, one of two third grade teachers. He had a paddle. He dealt out corporal punishment. Not to me, thankfully. Um, and the whole class was kept after school one time. Um, the next time, my mother had written a note and said, Gary doesn't misbehave, and he concurred. So the next time, he said, the whole class is staying after school, except Gary Ames. <laughs> that didn't have time to Biggest smilers were Jason Young and Margaret Valero. Biggest smilers. We actually had smiling lessons back in the 70s. Do you remember those? Anybody? Smiling lessons? And believe me, Mr. Spinner's class, you had to have smiling lessons. Uh, and there I am, and with my new neighbor, Jessica Crowley, who moved into the neighborhood, and Kiki Norris, there's still Jennifer, who will kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't be, but, you know, to be fair, um, you know, to Elizabeth, all the kisses I had with Jennifer were closed mouth kisses. So, uh, uh, Jesse Buchanan, a big head to me, and, uh, and we swear danced in this year. This, uh, we didn't do anything in second grade show-wise. In kindergarten, we sang that Carpenter's famous song, or the one they made famous, sing, sing a song. And in second grade, we didn't do anything. First grade, we did Peter Rabbit. Third grade, the two third grade classes square danced together. So I got to square dance with every girl I ever kissed that year. It was great. Uh, although there was no kissing in the dosi do It wasn't like dosi do and kiss your partner. So then we go to East, uh, to uh, Park Street School, which was the high school at one point. But when we went there, it was fourth and fifth grade. Mr. Garrett was my heavy teacher who brought in his guitar, and people think I've inherited his wardrobe. He <laughs> cast us in The Wizard of Oz. I played the Tin Man. Uh, my friend McDuff was the Munchkin, because he really was a Munchkin. Um, Anna was the Wicked Witch. And Heather Young, Jason's cousin, was um, Dorothy. But she didn't like boys in that way yet. So instead of hugging us all goodbye when she left Oz, she shook our hands. Obviously, the most of all, and Scott Shattuck was the scarecrow, and Betsy, who I don't think is in this picture, was the cowardly tiger because we couldn't get a cowardly lion costume. So she was the tiger instead. There I am. Jason Chadbourne was my best friend at the time, another Jason. I love those pants he's wearing. Um, he punched out my tooth at, uh, at the locker, but I think I was picking on him, and I caught up with him recently for an hour and 40 minutes on the phone, and he was so unhappy to think that he had bullied me. And I said, you know what? I probably picked on you enough that you did it. But at recess, he and, and McDuff, I was no longer kissing girls at recess. They used to just punch me in the shoulder all recess long uh, for some reason. And um, uh, Scott Shattuck, I kind of wanted to kiss, but I wasn't quite there yet. There's Courtney again. She's looking a little sad because I'm not kissing her anymore. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so that was fourth grade. And then in fifth grade, uh, Mrs. Metcalf was the teacher, but she didn't come the whole year, maybe because she heard I was in the class. She had back problems. And Johanna Hunter's mother, Janice Hunter, came in and was our long-term substitute. I was there for three quarters of the year until I moved to Delaware. And we'll get to that picture, there we go. And before I moved to Delaware, I was on a team for the school for the spelling bee. And when we were looking at houses in Delaware, I was learning those 50 words, and then we moved away and I couldn't be in the spelling bee. And the al alternate kid they put in for my, my place lost for the school on the word connoisseur. And I knew how to spell the word connoisseur, C O N N O I S S E U R. I knew all of those 50. So, you know, I could have been the script spelling bee champion. There's the twins still looking smug and pretty. And uh, let's see who else is here. Um, well, it was a pretty good year. So, and Jill Thomas, she's a lovely Native American young lady who my girlfriend Jennifer was trying to convince me that I was into. So, to sort of soften the blow that she didn't want to have a long distance relationship with, with me at age 11. Um, but I did. I missed her horribly. And uh, yeah, so that was my elementary school, and I had a great time. Kids have continued to grow up there. You know about Springfield, Vermont, kind of had a decline. There's a prison there now, all the factories kind of closed down, and, and so they didn't enjoy it so much. But I only lived there until 11, and I loved it. And I'm going back there in October, and it's going to be amazing. And, uh, so thank you for going down memory lane with me. Produced by Say It Forward Productions as a fundraiser for the Turning Point Center in Burlington. Though I never use their services, I am glad to know they are here for those who need them. I have several friends who have benefited from what they have to offer and was pleased to write this for their cause and to have another story to tell. Gary the Fairy. That's what my friend Darius called me in the eighth grade. It's a wonder the moniker hadn't been applied before then. It never occurred to me to call him Darius the Ferris in return. I lied to myself that the slur was due to the fact that a splint on my broken right ring finger made my pinky stick up. 
More likely, it was because he saw me looking at him and other boys in the locker room during gym class. I wasn't allowed to participate in gym because of my broken finger, but I had to go to the gym anyway and do my homework, watch the girls play kickball, or just hang out waiting for the bell to ring. Talk about emasculation. And at that point, for the first time in my life, I wanted to be someone else. I was given the chance within a year when my parents decided to move from Delaware back to New Hampshire, where they'd grown up. As the only people there who knew me were relatives, I vowed to train my family to call me Rick, the nickname of my middle name, effectively leaving Gary the Fairy far behind. At the same time, I began the extracurricular activity of repeatedly becoming someone else on stage. I performed a few times as a child and preteen, but it was in high school as Rick that I truly became enamored of portraying characters. Hi, diddly dee, the actor's life for me. But like Pinocchio, who sang that song in the Disney film, I was lying to more than my audiences. My high school theater director gave me great roles, which garnered me state awards. But she also throttled my neck histrionically and ordered me to muster more energy in my performance. At the State Drama Festival, when I was 16, the night before we performed, <coughs> friends got me to drink a Mountain Dew, my first, <laughs> which they dosed with a no-dose caffeine pill. The energy I experienced and exhibited convinced me to start taking them regularly. Within weeks, I was handing out three brands of caffeine pills for free to high school theater friends and continuing to take them myself. Aside from the codeine I'd been on briefly after my finger surgery a couple of years prior, that was my first regular chemical habit. A year later, en route to the New England Theater Festival to represent our state, it was my birthday, and friends gave me a Soho soda bottle filled with Captain Morgan's Spice Rum. Though I'd sipped a bit of blackberry brandy as a child to help with a bad cold and snuck one of my uncle's wine coolers, my 17th birthday was my first time being drunk. I was nauseous the next morning and afternoon but still gave a great performance. By then I kicked the pills, but fell head over heels in love at first sight with booze. Not long after that, I confessed to my family that I wanted to be an actor. My father said, you'll never make a living at that, son. His mother told me, there are a lot of homosexuals in the theater, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rick, Nanny, Rick. <laughs> I hope my dad was wrong, and deep down, I hope my grandmother was right. <laughs> During senior year, I only attended two parties at the homes of classmates whose parents were away. Though they were imbibing as well, friends mentioned that I had a drinking problem. Already. I felt for the only alcohol in our house, which was in several half-empty bottles in a basement workshop in a cabinet with shellac and turpentine. Some had been brought by my grandparents, and some were remnants of my gay alcoholic uncle who had OD'd on drugs some 15 years earlier. I didn't have the opportunity to drink often, so maybe that's why when I was able to drink, I did so to excess. Or perhaps it was due to the alcoholism on both sides of my family. Once friendly young tipplers whose metabolisms had changed, transforming them into older, angry, knock-down, drag-out, fighting sots. When I was 18, I wound up with drunk driving charges after falling asleep and or passing out and driving off the highway and into a tree. I totaled my car, I paid $975 to get off those charges, and consequently, never learned my lesson. I continued to drink and drive for nearly five years until I finally wised up in the fall semester of junior year at St. Michael's College. I graduated with low honors, but the smartest thing I did while there was to quit drinking. I lost weight, gained respect, and never again blacked out. I realized if I didn't come out to some friends as gay, at least, I was going to start drinking again. So I came out to a lot of people at college in late 1993, but didn't come out to most people in my life until about a decade later. I continued to escape into the roles I played on stage and in short films. Yet I persisted in the use of mind-altering chemicals. Free of booze, my marijuana use blossomed, and was occasionally accompanied by mescaline or LSD. In the ensuing years, I experimented sporadically with pharmaceuticals, cocaine, mushrooms, ecstasy, MDMA, and once, crystal meth. Whenever I used those harder drugs, I always had a good amount of weed on hand to keep me mellow when things got too free. I was never in a circle that used intravenous drugs, so I didn't fall into that pool of substance abuse. As I slowly matured, I stopped doing the craziest things, but was still a daily pupper. And while I was a social toker, I smoked alone a lot as well. At last, on April 1st, 2016, I made the tough decision to give up marijuana 
something I'd only had a break from for just under eight weeks in 2005. The next morning, I sang a song I'd written for my cousin Kimberly, a kid whom I cared for as a baby. I sang it at her funeral service as she had overdosed on heroin just over a week before. For the next three weeks, my job was driving me crazy. When I went to the community health center, they brought in a counselor who recommended a psych evaluation and said I was suffering from cannabis withdrawal. No, I'm not, I barked. But as the withdrawal subsided, I realized that's exactly what it had been. Four weeks after being chem free, I tripped in a crosswalk and fell to all fours, causing an open fracture of both bones in my left forearm. I was wearing this like new thrift store shirt for the first time. I had surgery that night, and the following night was back on stage for 10 more performances over two weeks of the musical Hair School, albeit on two types of narcotics with pain. Once the pain abated, though, I dropped the narcotics and never looked back. Whether caffeine, alcohol, marijuana, or other habit-forming toxins, we can only fully realize the extent of an addiction when we have stopped and had time to at least partially detox. We dream about it, but if we are strong of will, we don't do it again. We must understand the reasons why we do things in order to stop doing those things. A late elder friend who escaped three concentration camps as a Polish youth to fight with the British told me they drank during World War II so they wouldn't smell the dead bodies. Now that's a reason to drink. One that makes my reason seem quite insignificant. Now that I'm fully out and fully sober, I still go by my middle name, but my first name has been public knowledge for over 25 years, and I am not ashamed. When I think about it, I may never have been. A fruit, a fairy. Well, fruits are sweet, delicious, and nutritious. And fairies are helpful, beautiful, and magical. This fairy conquered his demons. Good has prevailed over bad. I am happy and proud to be Gary the Fairy. <laughs> the next song from my co-40th birthday party with friend Rick Roman. I was feeling broken up and broken down. Though I now realize that age is merely a state of mind, it's still a fun, frolicsome lyric, and I am fortunate that my brother married well. My sister in love, Leanne, and her honest Millie swing band colleague, Agnes, created an artful arrangement, as have all my amazing composer friends for other songs in this show. <laughs> And that it's time to do some reconstruction. Upon her wise instruction, it can be a tax deduction. Hell, even my taint ain't safe from destruction. One doc said there's a soft spot on my skull cap. I told him that's an awful lot of bull crap. I went and took a full sap from the wine cask, it's a full tap, even though he said that fools would make my whole snap. A dancer has to answer to his shin splits. Take a seat, get off my feet, and eat some thin mints. The tights in for a spin rinse, how the tightness makes me grin wince. Without pain and vain, I never quite have been since. <laughs> such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. My mind seems to be like White River Junction a hundred years ago, with ten tracks on which a hundred trains come through daily. The whistles continue to blow throughout the night. I'm not so sure how much deep sleep I achieve, but my dreams have always been extremely action-packed and compelling, and I wish I could record them to turn them into feature films. Imaginative type that I was, my hypermentality was influenced by many factors including television, comic books and other literature, and my colorful family on both sides. 
I have not had recurring dreams much as an adult, but there were four I had as a child living in Springfield, Vermont. I wonder about the energy in that house. All four dreams began in the second story bedroom that I shared with my little brother. He on the trundle bed that daddy built with me above him, holding hands as we slept. Awake, I was entirely fond of watching Adam West and Burt Ward as Batman and Robin. Na, 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 and I reveled in their escapades, rooting for them against the likes of the Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin, Catwoman, and all the rest. I even reenacted their adventures with my friend Jason Young on the playground, though we did not let Margaret Ann Valero play Batgirl as she wished. <laughs> I've only ever needed to lie supine or prostrate in order to fall asleep in the blink of an eye. My pulse in the pillow against my ear, my pulse in my ear against the pillow, rather, became the fatal footfalls of a dastardly, deadly dynamic duo determined to climb from the depths of the cellar, a scary place for most children, through the kitchen and dining room and up the stairs to kill me and my little brother. I dreamt that often. Mm. Other nights I dreamt that I was a superhero myself, either the Six Million Dollar Man or Wonder Woman, or perhaps a combination of the two. <laughs> On TV, both left from and to great heights in slow motion with a sound. You all remember, right? Yeah. So in the dream, I rose from my bed, and I walked to the acme of the stairs, and I leapt so high up, just like them, without the ceiling over the stairway that existed in reality, landing at the bottom perfectly. Each night I had this dream, my parents found me asleep at the top of the stairs with my baby blanket, my cape. This pattern provoked them to install a safety gate in case some night I should actually take flight. And then there was Mommy's twin sister, who was a witch and slept on the fold-out couch. Either she represented my mom's actual sister, who she was sometimes mistaken for, and who likely slept on a convertible furniture when she visited, or perhaps Mommy herself slept there when Daddy's teasing and too much chocolate made her witchy. Regardless, though the me having the dream saw her get up and walk up into the bathroom upstairs and knew it was not Mommy, Dream Gary was clueless. He got up from the bed and walked across the hall and knocked on the door, imagining she was in there shaving her legs or some other motherly task. And he heard, come in. And he opened the door, and she was right there next to the door. And she grabbed him, and she carried him, struggling over to the toilet. And she sat down, and she tickled him until I woke up from the reverie each night. I theorized that Molly was using a different fabric softener at the time, and I was just itchy. Itchy, witchy. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Daddy, on the rare occasion when he was home from his job on the road, found it amusing to dangle us by our legs over the toilet and depress the handle. While he never dumped us, and it did not scare us while it was happening, I did have several dreams about disappearing in a swirling pool of water. I always woke from that one quite flushed. I know I used that pun already. Some would call it repetitive. I consider it a comic callback. Now, the, uh, Fifth dream uh, was the abduction scenario, where a strange man, whose face years later I would recognize in a guest actor on different strokes, and in my first orthodontist, climbed in through the second story window and took me away. He took me to a house that looked like my house, but it was a cross section, like an open dollhouse. There was a family there who looked like my family, but I knew they weren't. And when I tried to shout, no sound came out. This dream may have begun when I was rehearsing to play Peter Rabbit in first grade. It seems like a primitive actor's nightmare. A house that is not your house, a family who is not your family, and an inability to say your lines. I've had variations on this dream theme over five decades of performing. Just had a dream about that two weeks ago. <laughs> a friend of mine quieted us while talking. Shh, I'm watching Porters. I replied that as it was being watched on demand, it could be paused, even rewound, and perhaps the friend was hoarding episodes of a show about hoarding. This same friend has been concerned over the years that I could turn into a hoarder, as I am definitely a collector of kitsch, of friends, of memories. But I have more than a narrow aisle to pass within my abode, and there are no missing pets nor pestering pestilence. And once I use these things I find on stage, it gives validity to my attainment. Psychological, illogical, psychological. 
psychological disorder. Something's wrong with my mind with this song at each line. Yes, you hit it, I'll admit it, into my cassette recorder. Oh, since 2000, when held hostage, I've been roused by every cross-stitch. Any Fisher Price toy from some 60s girl or boy and scores of novelty games. After all, my name is G. Ames. Makes an eclectic selection. <laughs> Many call it an infection and say I need correction, but it's harmless and not charmless. It does not require protection. Should you wish to lighten your load, leave it down by the side of the road. Add a trinket to my stockpile. Most folks think it's just a schlock pile. A garage sale or a yard sale. The Waterbury Flea Market, not a hard sale. If it's cheap or better free, give that heap of junk to me. Each antique is merely an antic. I'm a freak, it makes them frantic. They say, stop your shopping, your store hopping. I'm just cropping. No, you're flopping. I wheel and I deal. I holler and squeal. It is just I must amass, though it may yield a morass. Say they reform, conform, and I say, oh no, I won't perform. Though I might accrue a frightful slew, I'm not dividends. Call me dissident. It's no difference to you. In the wake of the events on September 11, 2001, I was awakened to run my life's purposes, to stand for peace. On weekdays from 5 to 5.30 for the next few years, I joined fellow peace seekers in a silent protest. And in 2003, I was part of the Peace March in New York City. The disdain we experienced for our ideals there and at home was disappointing. Someone told me then that the human race was not evolved enough for peace. I countered that I was. And if the rest of us didn't catch up soon, we wouldn't need to worry about it. I was at the UU at a vigil for peace. While above <laughs> us there flew several V forms of geese. Cars and trucks passed us by. Someone smiles, others frowns, as they drove home from work to their various towns. But from one of those trucks there came a loud shout, They killed our kids, we'll kill their kids, was yelled at us. I noticed the man who had screamed it and said, Hey, that is a guy who sometimes sells me bread. Well, pizza, that is. In the store, in the hall, in the downstairs part of the downtown mall. If you still won't hazard a guess where I mean, oh, just put an apostrophe S after Dino. Well, I guess he was right, for that's just what we're doing in a gesture of might which will ever be ruined. Now, I'm sure that our most intelligent leaders have had the bad thought, hey, let's kill their breeders. By killing their youth via bombs or starvation, who prevent their ascent, thus depleting their nation. We'll issue a draft, tell our boys they're dependable, though it's really the shaft, and it means they're expendable. And when every last person is dead on their soil, we'll go in and take over and take all their oil. And along will almost every last politician. Corporate America's made this its mission. So before you spend, no, though absurd and bewildering, the man with the dough favors murder of children. My first paid acting gig was at the Pheasant Lane Mall in December of 1988. My high school theater director, Donna Bacon, got me a job scaring people as the ghost of Christmas future, and I made $35 for an hour of that. Years later, out of work in late 2001, a friend approached me with a performing opportunity that paid $10 an hour. The audience was literally in my lap, and some of them were real dogs. I did this Yule time gig four times, <laughs> wrote this song about it just before my last season began. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Why you tell you little kids, don't go talking to strangers. You're 
concerned about sins and other toddler dangers. Then you suddenly change your tune about all that crap. You say, go on up to that strange old fat man and sit on his lap. I bring glee, I bring joy, many a girl and boy, but I also bring fears and too many, many tears. I can't do it anymore, I won't be a Christmas core, but there are reasons that I love it. Take this Santa suit and shove it. <laughs> now I've come to realize that it's terribly bewildering. I'm a flimsily disguised way to control your tiny children. <laughs> Tells her kids, there be no gifts without the picture is liable to find my hands upon her in a tracheal constriction. I hear laughs, I see smiles, they go on for miles, but I also see frowns of many kids from many towns. So if your talk says no, don't make them go while well, I enjoy high drama, I don't like causing trauma. Many parents are annoying. I give love, I give hope, but I'm at the end of my rope. Going out of my mind because I spend too much time with Santa Claus. So you'd better not pout, for this Santa is out. And you'd better not cry as I wave go. have a longer intro than the piece itself, so I'll curtail it. <laughs> well, I know I should be good, and I would if I could. If I could. Oh, I know I should be good, and I would if I could. <laughs> if I could. But I can't be good, because I've always been a hood. <laughs> Misrepresented and misunderstood. Oh, I know I should be oh so good, and I oh so would if I oh so could. I wrote three songs about my wonderful feline. His love and affection opened me up to get to know other neighborhood cats, whom I've also written about in song. Janice's full name was Janice, so named by his original owners after Janice Joplin, as they thought he was a girl. I called him Jan the Man, though he had been responsibly neutered, of course. He was a friend to all who knew him. Though he wasn't keen on visiting dogs, he put up with them. And while he had his claws, he never used them aggressively, except for the occasional mole he'd leave on the back porch for me to nearly step on with my bare feet. <laughs> Just the same. You finally come. 
And gentlemen, it's time for television's glamorous and clamorous game show. No, it's not The Price is Right. It's even more cacophonous. It's Automatopoeia, the game where we get the crowd to make some noise. And now, here's your handsome host, Buzz Ding Ding. <laughs> Hi, folks, and welcome to the show. For those of you tuning in for the first time, let's review the rules. I'll ask audience members to speak using only Automatopoeia in response to my questions. If you're correct, I'll yell, ding, ding. But if you're wrong, I'll yell, buzz. Yes, I like to hear the sound of my own voice yelling my own name repeatedly. I'm incredibly vain. But enough about me, for now. Let's start the game. If you'd like to play, please raise your hands. Or don't raise your hands, you're all going to play. Let's begin. Oh, right in the front row. Oh, lucky you. You know what I'm on a is, right, ma'am? Give us an example. Not one that's in the game already, please. Bang! Okay, that was wrong. Okay. So I, here we go. When you live, when you dive in a pool. I splash. Buzz, I'm sorry, we were looking for a sploosh. <laughs> it's a very fine line, but you lose. <laughs> yes, sorry. Sir, if you fall like a fool. <laughs> Speak into the mic, sir. <laughs> if you fall like a fool. Like if you felt like Elizabeth over here. I have no idea. Buzz, we were looking for a slat, thud, or clunk. <laughs> oh, and by the way, before we get going, uh, we're underway further, I want to mention that the grand prize for this episode is, are you ready? Two season tickets to the 2019 season of Corridors. <laughs> Absolutely free, folks. Absolutely free. So keep that in mind while we're playing. We're going to work our way around the room here. Uh, we're now onto the winds of war. Sir, the sound of a Tommy gun. Buzz, I'm sorry, we were looking for <laughs> Very close, though, very close. I mean, it's all in your vernacular where you grew up and everything, but you're wrong. Uh, sir, the sound of a bomb going off. Boom. Oh, Buzz, I'm sorry, we can't accept plain boom or pow. We wanted Kaboom or kapow. <laughs> Always start with a K if you can. It's just funnier, you know? Everybody knows a K is the funniest letter in the alphabet, right? But good try, good try. Man, the sound of knocking someone out. Pow! Buzz, we were looking for thwack, bonk, or boink. <laughs> what did I just say about K? <laughs> All right, now we're on planes, trains, and automobiles. This is the lady who came first to Quarry Works this summer and came three times to Superman, once her dogs, four, once her two dogs were in the dressing room with me during the show. It was great. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Is it Diane? Oh, All right, I knew it. All right, I can't promise that forever. Um, the sound of a plane taking off. Buzz, we're looking for whoosh or zoom. Boy, you people are really tight. <laughs> Some of you, it gets easier, I hope, or you know, harder and then easier. A locomotive. Ding, ding. That's exactly it. And for extra credit, it's horn. Oh. Buzz, we were looking for a whoo. Speaking of horns, uh, sir, the horn on a plate, uh, no, the horn on a Model T. Aruka, Aruka. Ding ding, that's correct. The horn on a VW Beetle. Aruka. Oh, well, we were looking for beep, beep. You know, a VW Beetle is a little less masculine than, uh, than a, a Model T. A Chrysler Town Car. Just come up with something. At least try, like your mother said, at least try before we leave the house. Buzz, we were looking for. Honk. <laughs> There's an awful lot of honkies in this room. I would have thought somebody would come with that. Uh, a steamboat whistle. Ooh. 
buzz. We're looking for toot toot. I don't know. Producers, can we come up with some easier questions for these people? Ah, Joan. Uh, a pogo stick. <laughs> what time is a poker stick made? Fuzz, we were looking for? Boring. 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 Everybody here knows. We have a lot of poker sticks. We'll go do them in the parking lot later. Okay, we're working our way. Oh, the animal kingdom. All right. Cat? A Pomeranian. Yeah, we'll count that as a yip. Yeah, ding ding. We'll give that to you. A German shepherd, Tony. Yes, whoop, ding ding, that's right. I'm gonna work my way back over to the board here. Uh, a mutt. Bark. Oh, Buzz, we were looking for art. Now we're on to other animals other than dog. Chicken. We were looking for cluck. Remember the K, remember the K. Turkey. Uh. Ding ding, yes, everybody knows a turkey, right? We all know a turkey. There's one in the front row over there. No, I'm just kidding. And she's my foil. She's been my comic foil for years, folks. We're like uh, Adam Costello, the two of us. And uh, where are we now? Crow. Oh, that's correct. Ding ding, canary. He's mute. Uh, mute uh, yeah, well, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, we shouldn't pick on people with, uh, you know, differently abled people. Uh, mouse. That was pretty good. But we were looking for squeak. It had a K in it. Remember? Uh, pig. Oink, oink. Yeah, the K gets it all every time. Um, horse. Nay. Why do you always have to contradict me saying nay like that? <laughs> You're right. Ding ding. Mule. That's exactly correct. Now, we're all the right age. We all saw some hee-haw on television back in the day, didn't we? Okay, I'm going to work my way around to you, ma'am. I'm just getting, getting the old guy here before he falls asleep. Um, cow. Oh, he grew up on a farm. Very good, ding, ding. Um, Sue, sheep. Oh, that was great. Miss G. Um, a goat. Oh, I don't remember that one. <laughs> That's almost like a sheep. It's yeah, they're very right. similar, very similar dialects. Right. Todd, lion. Roar. Lynn, B. <laughs> Buzz, that's my name, ding ding. All right. Everybody, frog. Oh, listen to the people, everybody. Snake. Oh, listen to those snakes. Boy, you're a cold hearted snake. We're catching my Okay, I'm not going to be called Abdul tonight. Time waits for no man. Okay, uh, anybody, raise your hand. A grandfather's clock pendulum swinging. Elizabeth, I'm going to give you another chance, actually. A grandfather's clock pendulum swinging. Okay, that's like a sound effect, and we want on and on here. Yes, thank you. Ding, ding, okay. Maybe we need to define the word on and on here. Okay, uh, everybody, a cuckoo clock chiming the hour. That was easy, wasn't it? Okay, but now a cuckoo clock chiming midnight. <laughs> it's amazing that I was able to get two ladies in the <laughs> And that's on tape, folks. <laughs> Bacon frying and uh, cooking in the frying pan. Sizzle. Sorry, we were looking for crackle. A K, come on, folks. Have you not learned a lesson yet about K's? Okay, these are the hard ones. So I need to raise my hand, and you need to really know what you're doing, so think hard. <laughs> Alliteration station. These multiple answers differ only in their vowels. So there's more than one word for these clues, and they differ only in their vowels. Like, um, you know, I'm a bumbling boob. That's an alliteration, you know. A pebble dropped in a potion, a rock dropped in the ocean. Is this thing on? <laughs> Anybody? A, well, a pebble dropped in a potion. Think of K. They got K's in the place. Oh, yeah, well, it was plink, plunk. A pebble dropped in a potion goes plink. A rock dropped in the ocean goes plunk. Apparently. That's what the producers tell us. A coin dropped on the floor. A closing prison door. A blow to make you sore. 
Clank, 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 plug. Yes, very good. We're going to hang a bit here. All right, good. This okay. Well, we're done with that. The sound of an incoming rotary phone call. I'm sorry. We were looking for dingaling, ding dong. Sorry, uh, or tingling, or one ringy dingy, two ringy dingy. I know you're all the right age to know that too. The sound of a doorbell. Ah, Buzz, we were looking for Bing Bong. It's all in the area you grew up in, folks. I think too many of you are from New Jersey or something. Okay, the sounds of music. A tuba. Ooh, pop, uh, ding, ding. A trumpet. A sad trumpet. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Weasel. Just for the record, before, I was confused and always have been between alliteration and onomatopoeia. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been able to give you a friendly answer. Oh, okay. Well, well now I hope you know the difference. All right, enough uh, chit chat from the uh, peanut gallery. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. Mark is one of my uh, arrangers, so he's got some wonderful music coming tonight. Uh, a bonus point, um, let's see, for you. How do you spell onomatopoeia? O N O M O T A P O E. Like, hey. Ding, ding, ding. You're the first one that looked at the program. Otherwise, people just don't care. Well, folks, we're all out of time. Thanks for joining us. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. Thanks for playing on La Pia. Let's make some noise. Here's another hastily created tune ruminating about mortality. Why does anyone have to go anyway? Though I guess if we didn't, given birth rates without death rates, we'd be trampling each other today. So we'll die, though we'll cry, at least we'll know why. Cause there'd be no more room if we all skipped the tune. Why does everyone have to die anyhow? We have used our resources and all out of forces. We'd be eating each other by now. Oh, we'll croak, Damon Bloke. The populace would choke from all of the toxins then, all out of oxygen. Dismal. <laughs> family trips, we played the license plate alphabet search game, tried to figure out what specialized plates meant, and even commented about numeric-only plates, which looked like great cribbage hands. This was our parents' subtle way of training us to remember identifying information, should we ever be victims of a hit and run. Here are some other thoughts I've had on these prison-produced placards. Dad's told me that in the late 1960s, when he was dating Mom, she wanted him to get vanity plates with their initials on them. But he refused. Too many of his buddies had done so, and then their gals dumped them, leaving them to drive around for the rest of the year with sad reminders of what was no more. However, once they were engaged, and Dad was away in the Navy, mm -hmm. Mom snatched up the vanity plate option. And when they moved from New Hampshire to Vermont in 1970 with their adorable infant son, she got the same place. Their married initials with an ampersand betwixt, D-A and J-A. These were more to me than my parents' initials. They were also da und ja, <laughs> yes, in German and Swedish. While I am, to my knowledge, no part German, my mother's maiden name is Svensson, so I am a quarter Swedish. You've got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, became my mantra, due in part to these plates. As well, yes and yes were often heard from my parents' bedroom when I was trying to sleep and they were trying to make my little run. <laughs> Years later, another plate that gave me a puzzle was this one. The New Hampshire plate with the wheelchair emoji followed by SEMA. That was my grandparents' plate. And my mother and I theorized that it was the singular of SEMA and thought my grandparents to be fairly crass. It was only years later we realized that it was Ames, spelled backwards. <laughs> See, Ma? Uh. When I graduated high school in 1988, I decided to get vanity plates. My parents put $1,000 down on a car for me as a graduation present, a used car. 
which was only a five-year-old car at the time. These days, I drive a 26-year-old car. It's a classic, let me tell you. Well, um, I could have gone to Ireland instead with my English teacher and some other students, but as my English teacher never gave back my assignments, I wasn't sure she would actually bring me back from Ireland either. <laughs> so I got the car, a Dodge Lancer, and the plates were free when my parents were young, but now it cost $26 for a year in 1988. I'm told it costs over $100 a year now by a friend who has vanity plates. But that was 50 cents a week, and so if I just gave up my big league two habit, I could afford it. So I got it, but I couldn't get, this was my nickname in high school. I went from Gary the Ferry to Slick Rick. But I couldn't get just Slick, because it was already taken, so I had to get the dash, or maybe it was a negative sign. So, six months after getting that plate on my new car, new to me car, in, uh, on December 23rd, 1988, at 2.30 in the morning, in slick conditions, my voice slick with alcohol, my throat rather, slick with alcohol, I drove off Interstate 93 into the median, down into the gully, and slammed into a tree, totaling my car. I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. I was thrown into the passenger side of the windshield and broke my nose and bled only onto an open box of tissues. <laughs> and I survived where I should have perished. Slick. Real slick. I had a great youth, and Santa Claus brought me many of the things I asked for. Though it was an actual motorcycle I requested at age four, not a big wheel. And he didn't bring me the little brother I wanted. He left that up to my parents. Just before Y2K, I wondered what another kid not as fortunate as I was might think about the jolly old elf. <sighs> doesn't come to my house anymore. Dad left us, he's a bum. Now Mom and I are poor. And every cent we have is spent on food and drink. I'm starting to think that Christmas really stinks. Other girls and boys will talk their heads to hear of other children's toys. While I'll just shed a tear, for I will not regale them with some tale I tell. Oh, go to hell, you jingle bell Noel. I don't like this time of year, it doesn't bring me any cheer. It is winter and I'm cold, I am only eight years old. And Santa doesn't come my house anymore. My daddy is a crumb. He walked right out our door with great neglect and no respect for me, his boy. For this I'll miss the bliss of Christmas joy. One look inside my head and there would Santa see a brand new big boy bed cause that's my fantasy. No present will bring pleasant thrill to me this year. I've lost, I fear, all trace of Christmas cheer. There was a time when I had fun, when Daddy loved his only son. And though my mom is really great, it's hard to put food on the plate. Now, Eddie down the block, and Jane across the street have nothing left to hop and little left to eat. Jane's dad's become a thief and Eddie's mom a whore. And they're not sure of Santa anymore. Christmas can be so nice, but here's the major hitch. It's only snow and ice, lest you're among the rich. And day by day, this holiday means less to me. I'm not impressed to see some Christmas tree. Though it's not this holiday from which all my troubles stem, I hope that I have kids someday that Santa Claus will come to them. Ah. Dawn and 
and Joanne Radcliffe are my theater parents, and they ran the St. Michael's College Drama Department and St. Michael's Playhouse for about 35 years. Before I met them, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had a double mastectomy and survived for nine years until it metastasized and took her from us. Throughout her struggle, she fought for research, helping legislators establish a Vermont mammogram registry in our state. When a patient checks in with me in my job for a breast MRI, and I hand her the DMR form to fill out, I'm reminded of Mrs. R. She taught me not only to act, but to take action. For funerals, faces frozen frowns tell trickling tears to trail to tongues. So sits some sadly silent slew upon pine pews, pale people pray. Huge hall holds hundreds heavy hearts filled full from flowers, family, friends. Jocund Joanne, just genuine joy. Sad service starts, some sweet song sung. Most mourners march, meet mossy mound. Dug ditch delves deep down damp, dark dirt. West wind whips wild, we wail with woe. Proud priest picked proper parting prose. Could countless colleagues carrying cries might make my much mourned mother move. Great God, grant Gary, give good grace. Let love life lost, lest love life. Years ago, I wrote a poem called The Cancer That Is New Hampshire. Years later, I wrote the song I sang last year, Here or There, about realizing that there are great reasons to live in both Vermont and New Hampshire. This song was another of the pieces I wrote when I was less than enchanted with my birth state. However, it's really just a humorous take on rural life anywhere and should be taken in the vein in which it was meant. Crack, you break your mother's back. Well, I don't know what you're worried about, Papa. 
Your mother's been dead for years. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> Mommy? Yes, Casey? How are babies made? Well, you're nine, almost ten. I guess if you want to know, I can tell you. Okay. When a woman loves a man, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, what do you think? <clears throat> that is so gross. <laughs> Mommy, yes, Casey. I'm sorry. Why, Casey? I begged you and Daddy for a little brother, and you had to do that twice. <laughs> That's right, just twice. <laughs> this was my entry in the second year of the Orca Media Case Songwriting Contest in Montpelier. I understand that there have been, and will perhaps again be, unnecessary war, but it is my individual opinion that there is no such thing as a good war. As long as there is money to be made from war, it will persist. How can the Judeo-Christian tradition support war when the sixth of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not kill? The assignment with refinement was a song on pacifism. But the duality between reality and peace leaves quite a schism. Didn't want to write a poem, didn't need to sing a song to make the world know what it does already. War is wrong, war is wrong, it's a scam, and it isn't worth a damn. A money making and life taking spirit breaking sham. From hi fi up to wi fi, we've got every sweet amenity. That modern life could offer, except for that sweet serenity. That same high tech could one day wreck this earth which we inhabit. From each dot com to each smart bomb will ruin it. Dang, it. War is wrong, it's a con, where the poor are put upon by the wealthy, very healthy, so their riches will grow on. Some people say they're scared of peace, I know just what they mean. It's hard not to be scared of things that you have never seen. Oh, no, I've not known it for real. I've seen peace in my dreams. At night, the light within me brings the screams. War is wrong. War's insane. Anyone with half a brain knows that hate and bombs and bullets sure will bring us down the drain. A truth that's true, we just can't preach. We'll never know world unity, lest we stop allowing governments to slaughter with impunity. The solution revolution often seems quite insurmountable, but we must try to be just and hold those warmongers accountable. War is wrong, it's a hoax that our leaders try to coax. We the grieving to believing is the mix for broken folks. If we work to help each other, after Jesus we were styled, we'd instill a chill goodwill into each woman, man, and child. If we took it even further, made all nations understand, think what bliss could come of this in every far off foreign land. War is wrong, war is crap, a dehumanizing trap. It's important, it's important, we address it, make a flap. A happy thought that were it not for some dumb president's myopia. His greeds, his needs, nefarious deeds, we might achieve utopia. So now go and be benevolent, then by simply spreading enmity. Stop the prevalence of malevolence and avoid global calamity. War is wrong, war is wrong, God did not intend the strong. To suppress, oppress, depress the weak, each week and all year long. As you may guess, this song's three 
verses explore my feelings on immediate family, extended family, and the friends I've collected. As my mom is the middle of 11 children, and I have 30 cousins on her side, my extended family is huge. And so many wonderful people exist whom I am fortunate to call friend. To show them all would mean they'd flash by so fast, you wouldn't be able to make any of them out. So I'll leave the pictures of my parents, my brother, sister-in-law, and nephews that were taken a few years ago as representative for the whole song. I hope you feel the same way about your family and friends. Immediate family is called immediate cause they're always there in a flash with emotional support, a hilarious retort, and let's face it, on occasion, a little bit of cash. Now, excuse me as I do cheer about them. I just wouldn't be standing here without them. They taught me how to act so heavily. <laughs> how I love my immediate family. Extended families call extended Cause they go to extents just to reach you Honor uncle when your parents ought to be another parent Listen up you silly pups, they got many things to teach you Oh, forgive me if I should rave about them My life would be oh so very brave without them They might shake hands a little clannily Still, I love my extended family. A network of friends is called a network. Cause you cast a net and try to make it work. Be real nice and job and play. Just be happy and be gay. Otherwise, the other guys and gals will think that you're a jerk. Well, please pardon while I just brag about them. My day-to-day -day life would be a drag without them. Even though it's very hard to get work, it's great to have an awesome social network. Immediate family and extended, and all of the lovely folks I befriended. My spirits you do elevate. Thanks for coming my way today to celebrate. Some policeman seeking glory after a cover story. 
is apt to go through fire and will die. So put it down and let's just talk. We've been surrounded since 10 o'clock. And what more can I say? It's nearly two. The kids are gone. They've got them out. There's nothing left to shout about. It's all come down to merely me and you. Here, hon, take a tissue. You can take your issue further. You'll have time to think in jail. That you'll learn to live through. People will forgive you. Maybe you'll even get out on bail. So tell the officer on the line, you'll take her offer to just resign. Admit that you were wrong to act this way. You haven't won, your plan is lost. Give up your gun and pay the cost. Come on, dear Debbie, let's call it a day. Okay, what do you say? Say it once more. 
for the wish of you. I have come so far thanks to the two of you. Yes, I owe my life to a husband and wife who have kept me free from strife. You thought to tell me what we've got.